Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Shh. Boy, everybody's having fun. T T G I F. Good morning. All right, that's a good that's a good response. I won't ask you to do that again. I'm Ron Gonzalez. I'm uh, proud to be the chair of the board of directors for SV at Home. We want to welcome you uh, at the, the kickoff of Affordable Housing Week, and we thank you for your attendance this morning. We are looking forward to a very productive conversation uh, this morning uh, around an issue that only seems to get more and more important and more and more a crisis. You know, every year we we talk about this, and now we're hopefully getting to a point where we're starting to see a lot more action. So we appreciate you being here as part of that effort. Uh, I want to introduce uh, a number of guests, uh, special guests. We're all special, but these folks are special because in their hands we put our trust to start dealing with this issue from a legislative perspective. So um, we're going to use what is called, uh, commonly called now the Santa Clara CLAP uh, recognition process. Uh, how many of you are familiar with that process? Ah, good. It's now become part of the Silicon Valley culture. So those of you who aren't familiar, we clap one time for each person that I introduce. Uh, all of them are either elected officials or representatives of their elected officials. So we're going to practice. Let's see how much rhythm you have on a Friday morning. So when I get to three, on the count of three, I'm going to pr just pretend like I gave you a name and you do the one clap. Okay, so you ready to practice? One, two, three. Oh, that, yeah, yeah, it's taking hold. It's taking hold. <laughs> three years ago, we would have had to do that probably three times. So it, it is working. So... So, um, on, be, on behalf of Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren, we have Victor Lecha. Good. We have himself, S Senator Scott Weiner. On behalf of Senator Bob Wykowski, Rocky Fernandez. By himself, or for himself, Assemblymember Ash Kalra. For Assemblymember Mark Berman, we have Zachary Ross. Assemblymember Evan Lowe, Jason Baker. Assemblymember Mark Stone, Angela Gile. I believe we have uh, from the Santa Clara Water District, one of the board members there, Linda Lazat. A trustee for the San Jose Evergreen Community College District, Wendy Ho. Uh, the mayor of Cupertino, who I'm sure never has her last name pronounced correctly, and I'm not going to try today, but Mayor Savita, uh, Savita Vadanov. There you go. See? <laughs> All right, that's better they pronounce it than me. Uh, the mayor of Los Altos, Mayor Prochnow. Uh, the council member from uh, Los Altos Hills, um, uh, Michelle Wu. The mayor of the uh, city of Morgan Hill, Steve Tate. Council member from Morgan Hill, Rich uh, Constantine. From our, our host city, Mountain View, the mayor, Ken Rosenberg. Vice Mayor Lenny Siegel. Council Member Lisa Manichek, and former Mayor and Council Member Pat Showalter. Uh, the Vice Mayor of Palo Alto, Liz Niss. On behalf of Mayor Sam Licardo of the City of San Jose, Reagan Henninger. Uh, on behalf of Vice Mayor Magdalena Carrasco, Huscar uh, Castro. On behalf of Council Member Silvia Rennes, uh, Joshua Burroughs. I believe we have Council Member Deb Davis. Council Member Lan Diep, Council Member uh, Sergio Jimenez, and on behalf of Council Member Don Rocha, Jacqueline Jojonimo. And from the City of Santa Clara, we have Council Member Teresa O'Neill. From Sunnyvale, uh, the Vice Mayor Gustav Larson, Council Member Michael Goldman, Council Member Nancy Smith. Very good. A plus. Thank you so much for that. I am betting right now that we missed someone, so if we did miss you, please give your business card to one of the staff, and we'll introduce you a little bit later. Or if you're brave enough, introduce yourself right now. Did we miss anybody? Okay. Man, that's another first. Wow. We're on a swing. Well, again, thank you for joining us, uh, the Board of uh, Directors for SV at Home and our staff. 
uh, are delighted with this attendance as we kick off the week. Um, in your packet, you have one of these uh, brochures, one-page brochure that talks about all of the activities that are going to take place uh, this week uh, of uh, Affordable Housing Week. We really encourage you to participate in a number of them uh, that you're available, uh, that your schedule allows you to attend. I do want to put in a special plug, total conflict of interest. You'll note on February, on uh, Friday, May 19th, it says Happy Housers. Uh, that's the mixer. That's going to be in my backyard. So we can only we can only fit about 100 people there. So I really encourage you to sign up for that one quickly. So uh, we'd love to have you in our backyard as we finish off the week and celebrate another week of affordable housing advocacy. Um, of course, this is we are we are wonderfully celebrating our second anniversary at SV Home. It's been an incredible journey thus far, uh, and we're very very proud of the work. <clears throat> Uh, that our board has done, our staff has done, <clears throat> and of course our members. How many of you are members or your companies are members of SV at Home? Look at that. That's fantastic. Okay. Shame on you that didn't raise your hand. No. <laughs> Hopefully by the end of the morning, you'll be convinced to have yourself or your company join the membership. It's very, very important to be with us. Um, I'd like to ask our board of directors to please stand and be recognized. Board members, please stand. I'd like our staff to please stand. They may be all outside, but we got, I know Leslie's there. Yeah. And not you know, least, but you know, last but not least is our members. If you're a member person or company, please stand. You raised your hands earlier, but let's recognize you again. Great. Fantastic. Okay. So, so one of SV at Home's goals is the engagement, you know, the, the education and engagement process that we're finding is more and more important to advocacy for affordable housing, whether it's at the city level, the county level, the state level, and even more so now at the federal level. Don't get me started. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, the sharing of ideas, and that's one of the purposes of this morning's program. So we really want to encourage you to ask our panelists questions, to hopefully engage them during the breaks and, and any time you possibly can. The policy breakfast is one of those opportunities, as I mentioned, to, and we're lucky to have a great panel lined up that will be coming on in a, in a few minutes. Uh, so we encourage you to, to stick through the event with us and hopefully uh, you'll get something out of it. So I do want to take a moment and acknowledge uh, a number of people who have made, or a number of organizations who have made this morning possible, our sponsors. Uh, first, the title sponsor, uh, I don't know if we have a representative here, but if we do, someone from, or everyone from the Santa Clara County Housing Authority, if, you're, if you are with them, there you go, there you go, all right, fantastic. Our platinum sponsors, we're going to go back to the one clap rule, okay? Our platinum sponsors, Google, LinkedIn, the County of Santa Clara and the city of San Jose. All right. Next, the gold sponsor, one clap, the Sobrato Foundation. Um, then we're going to point out that on the screen here that we have uh, the listed uh, sponsors that are the silver, bronze, and housing ally sponsors on the screen. So let's give them a round of applause. All right. That's OK. I didn't say one clap. You're all right. You're still doing A plus. All right. Uh, we're delighted that, uh, I had it here shortly, but just on your, on your program, on the front cover of the program for today, you'll see some artwork done there. And I was told that that is the result of a competitive process that uh, SV at Home had. And we're delighted that the artist who designed the winning design that's on the front cover is with us. And his name is Adrian Avila. Adrian, where are you at? Adrian is not with us. All right. Well, he's probably saving himself for one of the events later in the week, which is the artist reception. So if you want to meet Adrian and thank him for his artwork, look up uh, the, that date. I think it's uh, Wednesday of, of next week, sometime this week, uh, where they're going to have all of the artist uh, community be involved with that event. All right. Let's get on with some opening remarks. We're delighted, as I mentioned before, 
uh, to be here in the city of Mountain View, who's been a leader in affordable housing in the community, and that's certainly because of its mayor, working to, to seek solutions to the jobs housing imbalance uh, in North County, where many of our jobs are located. Uh, I was talking earlier with my old friend Larry Stone. <laughs> Boy, this is such a political group, man. Um, Larry and I, a lot of people don't know this, but we actually served on the Sunnyvale City Council many, many years ago, as I like to say, in the last century. And the first six months of my service on that city council, we dealt with the jobs housing imbalance. In fact, we implemented a, an industrial moratorium where we stopped issuing permits. And um, I, I, I kind of chuckled a little bit this past week uh, for San Jose Council members, I'm sorry, but the hearing in the newspaper that you were being called communist I said, that's, that's old stuff. Larry and I were communists back in the, you know, the early 80s uh, because every, we knew every industrial developer in Sunnyvale because they were all at the city council meeting yelling at us about So jobs housing is, is something we're still working on. Their efforts right here in the North Bayshore area and East Wisman uh, seek to you know, find new opportunities for housing, and we're delighted that the mayor is with us today, and we want to encourage him to come on up and say a few words of welcome. Mayor? Oh, okay. And, and I also want to introduce uh, Katie uh, Farrick, who Katie is uh, here to, to represent LinkedIn and, and also Microsoft, Microsoft. Uh, and uh, she's a founding member of our organization and delighted that she serves on our board of directors of SV Home. So please take it away. Thank you. Good morning. And on behalf of Microsoft, uh, LinkedIn is now a Microsoft company. Welcome to this space. Uh, long before LinkedIn became a uh, part of Microsoft, this still felt like my second home because, my, as you probably have almost all been here, if not once, a dozen times, because Microsoft does open up this space about 200 days a year for about 200 events, so we're pretty lucky to have this resource. And uh, Mayor Rosenberg kindly wanted me to go first because he knew if he got the mic first that the whole five minutes allocated to this section would evaporate really quickly. So thank you. Uh, I just wanted to give you a reason um, why I would be interested in this cause in particular and why it matters to me. Uh, you know, we have, you know, LinkedIn really studies the jobs data and there's a lot of professions we all know that are migrating into or out of this area. And we can't afford to lose all the various professions, all the various people and individuals that make up our entire community. Uh, we're, in fact, really ironically shooting ourselves in the foot when city planners can't afford to take jobs here because they don't pencil out. So we aren't able to do the very thing we're here to do if we can't hire the people that can help make that happen. So uh, it is up to us, and we're all part of the solution. Thank you so much for being here. Mayor Rosenberg. You know, when you're sitting in the front row, um, there's only one person in front of you, so it looks like an empty room. And you get up here and you're like, uh-oh. Um, welcome, everybody, to Mountain View. You know, I, I've got this speech that I wrote, and, um, and I tried to memorize it. There's a lot of facts in here, and I'm going to do what I almost always do when I get to a microphone and, and ditch it. Um, I, I moved to Silicon Valley in 19, tail end of 1994, and uh, was recently married in, in 96, and um, bought our first house and moved in in January of 97. So uh, I'm almost 50 now. If you asked me then if my first house was going to cost over a quarter million dollars, I would have laughed you out of the room. This was back in 1996, 97 time frame. Um, that same house today, right across the street from the uh, downtown Mountain View Railroad Station, literally across the street, right in front of where the diesel engine stops and all that f fuel goes right into your, uh, your house, is about $1.4, $1.5 million. Inflation, wage inflation, has not kept pace. That house, if, if wage inflation uh, uh, kept up with the price of house, the price of houses would have been about... $700,000 today. So it's 2x what it probably should be, according to wages. I do not know how people can move into homes in their, for a starter home, for their first home. And we, that's not even talking about rent. That's just talking about houses, that they, they, ownership, that you can try to, try to set foot and set roots in the community. Um, one of the problems, as, as from a career, this is, this is a part-time, I moonlight as the mayor, 
Uh, I actually have a job, and it's as, as a financial advisor with Morgan Stanley. And one of the things that I see, this is, we don't talk about this a lot. What, what is one of the reasons why the prices of housing is so intractable? And we have a lot of successful companies here as measured by stock price. And one of the things that you can do if you're fortunate enough to be an employee of one of these companies, Google, LinkedIn, uh, Apple, Facebook, you name it, there's, a, there's just a ton of them around here. And everybody in this room knows somebody who works at these companies. Is you can leverage your stock that you own, not have to divest a cent and get a mortgage against your, or get a loan against your million, $2 million stock position. Companies like Morgan Stanley do that. Merrill Lynch does that. Goldman Sachs does that. So if you're fortunate enough to have a couple million dollars in company stock that you got through RSUs or stock options, you don't have to sell a thing. By the way, there was a house in Palo Alto just recently that sold for $675,000 over asking. How does that happen? So this is a problem, and I'm so happy that you all showed up here today to talk about it. Um, Mountain View is obviously uh, very proud. I'm proud to represent Mountain View. Uh, for some of the steps that we have taken. And it's a purposeful number of things that we have done. But I, it starts really with articulating what our goals are. So a couple years ago when I got elected and so forth, um, and I campaigned on building housing in the North Bay Shore. It wasn't even legal. In fact, at this moment in time, it's still not legal. The precise plan hasn't changed. But we're trying to change that. But we campaigned on that, right? But we articulate our goals. And so two years ago, we put out uh, sustainability, transit, and housing as, as an articulated goal, especially affordable housing. Uh, we recently, uh, in the new council, uh, changed our, our articulated goal to, and I'll quote, improve the quantity, diversity, and affordability of housing with an added focus on the middle income and ownership opportunities. So that last couple of words about middle, uh, uh, middle income and ownership opportunities, that's a new addition to our goals in Mountain View. Uh, and we had to add, and this is kind of a side note, uh, we had to add uh, another goal. So we articulated three two years ago, and now we have a fourth. And the fourth is to promote strategies to protect vulnerable populations and preserve the socioeconomic and cultural diversity in this community. That's kind of a response to Trump. Um, I like to refer to him now as former President Trump. Might be a little early, but we're getting there. Um, just wait. Um, <laughs> so... I don't want to get into all the things that Mountain View has done because I think most of the people in this room have, uh, uh, are aware. But I will say that we are actively, consciously, purposefully trying to make a difference in our town. It does bother us as, as leaders of this community that some of our adjacent neighboring communities aren't doing the same. Uh, if the uh, former uh, Mr. Gonzalez mentioned the East Wisman and the North Bay Shore. How many people had a problem getting into the North Bay Shore today? That's where we are right now, in the North Bay Shore, because of getting off the freeway and traffic and so forth. So right now, there's, there's a few houses going on. They're, they're just uh, some uh, uh, um, mobile homes not too far away, but there's no real permanent housing up here. Council wants to do about 9,700, 9,800 units in this area. Can you imagine taking 10,000 people off the road because they walk, walk, they're walking distance to where they are, to where they work? That would be awesome. Uh, the East Wisman area, is, is, uh, just east of here, is a similar type of thought process. So we are actively in Mountain View working to solve this problem, and we look forward to working with Silicon Valley at home, and we're very uh, excited that, uh, that this organization has taken root and has become, look at this, this is the second year. It's an independent organization now, and look at, look at this room. Testament to how, how big this issue is, how important it is. And I'm going to leave you on one last thought. In, uh, last year in December of 2016, the Council of Mountain View voted to be, uh, for Mountain View to become a human rights city. Now, if you look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, one of them, one of the line items is housing is a human right. So I want to commend everybody in this room for doing the important, the important work of human rights. We know that there is an assault on human rights right now from a federal level, and you're doing human rights work on a local level. So a big round of applause for all of you, and welcome to Mountain View. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Rosenberg. Uh, I'm now going to ask Leslie Corsigler to come up as she comes up. I, I remember fondly uh, one of the first meetings I had with her uh, when I was mayor, when first started as mayor of San Jose, and and I think I scared her to death because I took her housing goal for affordable housing and doubled it. 
And, and she didn't faint. She got to work. And, and in eight years, we built 11,000 affordable homes in the city of San Jose. So, yeah. So, Leslie. Thank you, Mayor, and welcome. Um, I'm going to make this really quick because we have some speakers we really want to hear hear from. But um, I I did want to say that uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with with Silicon Valley at Home, one of the things we do are events like this. We also uh, spend time uh, on education, information, statistics, and learning, and trying to change the the conversation to change the dynamic around around housing. And some of, you know, Mayor Rosenberg was just talking about uh, transit and getting here. One of the things we need to talk to people about is uh, the importance of housing. Housing and housing development does not cause transit problems. The reason why we have a transit problem is because we don't have enough housing. Uh, people are having to drive too far to get to their job. Uh, and the head of MTC, Steve Heminger, often says we have a transit problem, but we have a housing crisis. And we really agree that, with that, and we really need to make that message known. Um, okay, next. Um, we, in your packet, we have a roadmap update. Last year, if you were here, we released our roadmap. Uh, we do have extra copies out at the front. If you uh, need a copy, we also have it online. Uh, but uh, one of the big things that we did accomplish as a community this year uh, was the passage of Measure A. So for everybody, yeah. yeah. When, when we stood here a year ago, this was just a thought. Uh, and in a few short months, it was actually an initiative on the ballot. And a few short months later, uh, the voters approved it. And now uh, the county is in the process of uh, starting to implement with the first funds from that measure expected to be available in the fall. Uh, so really excited about that. But we have a lot more work to do, and we know that. So if you get a chance to look at the roadmap update, we do talk about a few of the victories we had in this, in this year. Uh, we know this is going to take us more than one year. Uh, and we will continue to report back to you each year with the progress that we're making on the roadmap. And I would like to say that, that we feel very strongly at SV at Home that, um, that while we're helping convene and we're helping uh, educate and we're engaged in advocacy, uh, that really it takes all of us. And it's a partnership. Everything we do, uh, we do in collaboration with others. And so really thank, thank you all for working with us. Lastly, I would like to spend a minute to uh, talk, walk you through our website. And uh, Nicole's going to come up and get it started here. Um, we wanted to be able to release it today, but we are still busily writing. Um, this is going to be a little different website than we have had um, than we've had in the past. Um, uh, when we started, we had a website uh, that we put together for five hundred dollars. And uh, it's actually not bad for $500. I think uh, it, it, um, uh, it has served us well. But what we envision is something entirely different, what we're working on. Is it? Oh, you need to get in there. Sorry. Um, so we'll get started here. OK. So um, what, what we have is um, this is a beta site. So we're going to have the ability for you to, to learn and so we'll have uh, what the latest stories are and information about affordable housing. You'll be able to go in and see, for example, uh, about the legislative session. And I'm not sure how to, how to scroll here. I'm, I, I, use, I use my finger. I don't use a, a mouse on this. So, um, so we'll have, um, have that ability. How do I get back here? Click the, oh, OK, there. Um, then, um, then we have the ability to act or speak up. And one of the things that we have right now is speaking of Mountain View and North Bayshore, we have a petition that you can sign. You can go in easily just to, to click the petition and you can sign and you'll see we, so far we have 44 signatures on this. So, um, so that, um, that's been helpful. Again, I'm not sure how, I'm going to need you over here, Nicole, to get me back and forth here. Um, I've been doing this on my machine, but it's completely different. Um, OK, then um, we have the way for you to get engaged. And so this tells you all the meetings and events and activities that we have. We have the full calendar of events. You can click on any one of these and get more information. Um, 
scroll up, scroll down, oh, there. Oh, no, okay, down there. And so you can see we've got a lot of events right now. It's loading more. Um, and we will, if you have an event, we'll put it on here as a community event. Uh, May 25th is an example here. There's Palo Alto. Um, it, uh, uh, Palo Alto neighborhoods are putting together a session on ADUs. So we'll, we will um, we'll make that available, that information available to you as well. Um, then um, we do have, we have a lot of different uh, pages. We have our members, so you're able to see um, who our members are. And uh, from last year, that's changed quite a bit. We have a long list of members. Um, and we have a way for you easily to become a member by a number of different ways you can, can do that. But this is the signature part of the website that I'm especially excited about, which is our, our resource hub. So, uh, and this is where the writing uh, is happening and where we're, we're still working on it. Um, but we will have a, a whole series of different kinds of housing issues that you can look into and, uh, and get more information. So for homelessness, as an example, you'll be able to, and you, it, to find out how many people in the last homeless count were um, experienced homelessness and what the population is per 1,000 people So uh, in each city in the county. Uh, we'll be updating that soon because the new um, count is coming out. But you'll also be able to find out information about destination home, about the community home, planned and homelessness. There, there's additional resources. There's links to various organizations. We'll continue building on this. So uh, this is a way for people to learn. We'll have the information by jurisdiction. Um, so um, this is about Palo Alto. It's got a snapshot of the, the uh, city, its housing, its jobs, how it's doing with its RENA work. Uh, what affordable housing policies it has. You can get to their housing element and their comp comprehensive plan right here. Uh, we'll have uh, latest news uh, about what's happening in the city and also any related posts. Uh, so you'll be able to find out if you're interested in a particular city um, how, they're, how they're working. And then we will have uh, policy solutions. So these are our areas that Silicon Valley at Home is working on. Uh, this particular one is inclusionary housing. Again, you can click on, this, on the city and find out uh, basically what their requirements are for inclusionary zoning. And then you can see what our position is, uh, what the latest news is, and again, um, click and find more resources like uh, the AB 1505, uh, which if you're not aware of, is a very important bill called the Palmer Fix Bill. Um, and that's one that, that Silicon Valley at Home has, um, has taken a position on. So that's really where we are. I just wanted to introduce that to you. Hopefully in June, we're going to launch. And uh, we hope that you will, will use this as a tool uh, to find out what's happening in uh, Santa Clara County. We'll also, under our housing issues, we'll have uh, statistics and information that you can access when you are out in the public and you are giving presentations. You'll be able to come to this si site and get the latest information to, to uh, help you with your presentations. So with that, uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Nicole. So. Um, I should say Nicole is, is the one who is managing this project, and she's done an exceptional job, and uh, it's been a huge job, so I really appreciate her. Okay, great. Thanks, Leslie. Um, next up, we're going to take a few minutes to hear about the Santa, Santa Clara County Housing Authority. Uh, and I'm going to ask Catherine Raz to come forward as she does that. Let me just mention a few facts about the Housing Authority. Come on up, Catherine. You can you can join me up here. Um, you know, and some of the stuff I didn't even know. I didn't realize that it was created as you know in 1967. It's one of the largest housing authorities in our country. It's uh, it started with a mere nine employees and now has 145. Uh, this says it had at one point 300 vouchers. I'm guessing that's Section 8 vouchers. Now they have 17,841. Uh, they uh, early in the years did not have uh, did not own any of their own rental units. Now they own uh, just over 2,700. And uh, I know Catherine from uh, mutual experiences with the city, and I, I know her to be just fantastic, collaborative, visionary, and I think she's the perfect fit for the housing authority. And we're lucky to have her as a partner. So thanks so much uh, for, for being the title sponsor, Catherine, for Affordable Housing Week. And uh, 
I'll let you uh, take it from here. Thank you very much. I am the executive director of the agency, and we do have some of our commissioners here this morning who are not elected officials. Um, Kathy Espinosa Howard, our board chair, and uh, Commissioner Gardner. I don't know if there's any other in the audience that I don't see, but if you are and you want to raise your hand, I don't see any. Okay, thank you. Um, so, yes, as uh, Mayor Ron Gonzalez noted, in March 1967, the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors, vitally concerned about the apparent shortage of sanitary and safe housing available to low-income persons, resolved that there was a need for a county housing authority. I don't think it's a mere coincidence that 1967 also marks the 50th anniversary of the Summer of Love, a counterculture movement that sought social and political change and as we hear about the president's budget priorities, I think a, another counterculture movement um, for social and political change is needed. But I digress. The, um, as, as the mayor noted, the housing authority has grown quite a bit. I do want to add a footnote to the 17,800 uh, vouchers that we would be able to fund. That's if we were fully funded, which as it stands today, we, we are not. We're in the high 90s, but we're not fully funded. Um, we currently have committed rent subsidies to 13 different projects, not housing authority projects. These are, you know, include other developer projects throughout the county. This enables affordable housing community to serve special need populations. We are also under contract to buy property at two different sites in San Jose, and this is made possible by funding flexibility because we are designated as a moving to work agency. This is a special designation that we achieved in 2008 um, under the uh, leadership of the prior executive director, Alex Sanchez. We plan to be busy for years to come. There is more information about us in your folders. There is a brochure with a timeline on all of the highlights of our event. I know that everyone in this room has a commitment to and remains vitally concerned about the availability of affordable housing in the county, as do the voters of Santa Clara County. In celebration of our 50 years, we prepared a short film that reminds us all of why we do what we do. Each person in this film is housed under a housing authority program, either a Section 8 voucher or uh, un living in an apartment that we constructed. But their story could just as well be ours or of someone that we care for. These are stories of how housing can help someone make a home. Thank you. Man, this sure reminds me of home. I didn't have to worry about a thing. Nothing. My parents did everything for me. God, I've come a long way. My first memory is of home is Sundays after church. And I'd come, right when we come in the door, my mom had already cooked the night before, and she had um, Sunday dinner warming up, and we were like, oh, this is just magical, absolutely magical, just the smell of the whole kitchen and all my family there. In my childhood, uh, at 12, I met a girl, her name is Rose, and uh, we dated. Uh, for five years, and on May 5th, 1970, we were married, and she's the, she's the girl of my dreams, and if I had to do it over again, I'd do it the same way. I wouldn't change a thing. I was an only child, and I didn't have brothers or sisters. I had to work to help my mom. It was just the two of us that were in the house, because it was, I come from a divorced couple. When I was growing up in Modesto, um, when I was a child, I had a wonderful place to live, beautiful home, both parents worked, wonderful Christmases. 
you know, great brothers and sisters. The neighbors would look at us and say, hey, tell your mom and dad I said hi. And I'd go, okay. And he would walk down the street and people would say, those are the Joyner kids. I mean, I had reached my, the American dream that I was, well, I was always taught to, to want. Picket fence, two car garage, two dogs, two cats, a parakeet named Pete. <laughs> So everything else was, was, was the bliss, you know, I mean, the waking, waking up to somebody that I really loved, you know, feeling that, that warmth, just feeling her hair against my face, just those, those things were what made it so wonderful. And it was, I couldn't, that, I, I couldn't, I, it didn't seem like I could ask for any, anything more, and I, I saw it, I, I thought that it would never end. The future didn't bother me. I was pretty capable, and and uh, I had a husband who was beginning his practice, and we were surviving, and uh, we were just too busy with all those children and all those basketball games and everything. I would have always thought I could handle everything, and I kept on thinking that till I was 90. It was summer of my 14th birthday, and I was waiting to start high school, and my dad started sneaking in my uh, bedroom at night. And from that point, it was no longer a home. It was not a safe dwelling. Yeah, I raised the children. He worked, but um, he became an alcoholic, and then that destroyed the marriage. So then I took off by myself with the kids, me and my sons. At around the age, I think around 23, 24, I, uh, me, my sister and I um, started working for, we would go to, we started working for, we started stripping. We were strippers. When I quit working at 90 a couple of years ago, I, uh, I thought my social security, I just assumed it would cover everything, but then my uh, market price housing was, they, they raised my rent in one month, they were raising it $500. Well, that that puts a knock in your Social Security income and everything else, you know, so. About 13 years ago, yeah, um, she went for a physical and found out that she had uh, cervical cancer and a fairly decent world crumble on me. I had, I, had I, I could have maintained it, but I just didn't, I just didn't know how in the beginning until it was too late. Well, sometimes I can buy what I want or I have to ask my sons for, for them to help me. That's what I mean. I don't have enough money to buy what I want or or sometimes even what I need because I'm a low-income person, so. No. No. Never. Never in my wildest dreams coming out of the military would I ever think I was homeless. Never in a million years. I worked jobs. I worked a lot of jobs. And we were living in an apartment at the time and uh, with the money dwindling, I couldn't afford to pay the rent. We wound up being evicted and wound up in a car for six months, homeless. But I took my kids and I put them in friends' houses to make sure they had not, would not have to uh, inhere the difficulties we're going through. It was, there was a point in time we were thinking about killing ourselves because it was that bad. After all the the things that I did and all the drugs and all the running and all the partying, I found myself in jail. Woke up and I was in jail. I didn't want to make that my home. We went looking for places to live and we were told by a friend to go to the housing department. We went to Julian Street down in downtown San Jose 
And that's where we filed for the Section 8. When she passed and, and I let things go off the deep end, I realized that I needed help. And if it weren't for HUD Vash, and this is, this is accurate, this is the thing that I'm, one of the things I'm most grateful about, I would probably be living in my car or stuck in a homeless shelter. If I didn't learn about affordable housing, uh, I have a hard time finding an answer. What do you do? You try to find a little camp someplace, I suppose, or a bedroll, and you sit down in a doorway. I really don't know what I would have done. Home is not only physical, it can be emotional. And it's internal and external. And housing authority has became part of my home, just like the dwelling space that I have and my six beautiful daughters and my husband. Home is something sacred. It's a place where you can heal. It's a place where you're allowed to grow and change. And I finally have a home, and that feels good. <laughs> Affordable housing is important because it gives you a lot of security, happiness, and it helps a lot with the health of the person. It does help. Um, I, I, I'm actually want to say how much I've gotten out of life today, um, how far I've come, um, and I'm ready to do more. You know, one thing I really want to do, and I keep, I'm going to tell myself that I will do, is that one of these days, I'm going to give back my housing voucher to somebody who really, really will be glad to have it and honor it and cherish it like I do to own my own home. And I'm working for that now, and I'm going to do it. Oh, it makes all the difference in the world. You don't worry all the time. You know, what you do, it's just you have a home and someone has said it's dependable and you're going to continue to have it. It's the best feeling in the world. We need affordable, affordable housing. How can we exist otherwise? I mean, how can you exist when you're homeless? That's your question, right? How can you exist? That's, that's great. Great job to the Housing Authority. You, you know. uh, we're going to now move to our panel discussion, and I'm going to in, uh, invite uh, Emmett Carson to head up as I introduce the foundation. Of course, has uh, and was involved in the beginning of SV at Home, providing the seed funding to do the exploratory work needed to determine SV at Home's focus and scope. And we are proud to have uh, the continuing support of the Silicon Valley Community Foundation and Emmett Carson as we work to respond to our housing afford affordable housing challenges. So I believe, Emmett, you're going to introduce the panelists, and it's yes. all up to you. Thank you. Yes, I'm on. So I'm going to ask the panel to just come on up, and I will uh, introduce you after you're, you're seated in a moment after a few uh, introductory remarks. Let me start out by uh, uh, saying to uh, the Santa Clara Housing Authority, that was a very powerful film so thank you for producing that and uh, and and for for S, uh, SV at home I'm glad you've updated the I like the old website but the new website looks phenomenal so this is a huge upgrade so 650 huh <laughs> all right all right thank you I'm going to introduce our uh, 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 panelists and make a, a, a few remarks. I'm going to start at my very far uh, left, your, your right, Senator uh, 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 Scott Weiner, who represents the 11th, 11th District. And I would add that the Senator will need to leave uh, a little early uh, before the panel concludes. And so uh, I'm going to shoot him the hardest questions first and then let him, let him get out. Uh, next to him is Assemblymember Ashkara, my, my good friend, uh, representing the 27th 
districts. Ne next to him is uh, Paul Nito. Uh, Paul is the Executive Vice President of Signature Development Group, SDG. And in 2016, 2017, he was the chairman of the Building Industry Association of the, of the Bay Area. And then uh, sitting next to him is Carolyn Coleman, uh, who has, uh, for a little less than a year, about six, seven months, uh, is the new uh, executive vice president, uh, no, is the new uh, executive director of the League of, of Cities. So we're happy to have such a uh, stellar panel for some of these topics. Please join me in welcoming uh, the panel. So I, I wanted to begin by giving a couple of introductory comments to set the stage for some of the questions. And, and really three points. One, I think we have a jobs and mismatch of housing problem, right? And, and the jobs part is a good part. It's good that we've got job growth here. There are a lot of places we'd like to have that. The problem is, is that the housing growth isn't keeping up. And I was uh, just taken aback by uh, this statistic. Between 2007 and 2016, uh, Silicon Valley added 344,000 residents. We would have needed 130,000 new units over that period of time. We only created 69,000 new units. And so I'm an economist by training, and that tells me the only thing that can happen is price can go up when you have that kind of mismatch. But it's not just housing units. The rental market, which was mentioned earlier, uh, is, is going crazy. Uh, in our community, rental rates have gone up 27% uh, for apartments, 25% for single family homes. Uh, the majority of California renters, more than 3 million households, pay more than 30% of their income toward rent, and nearly one third, more than 1.5 million households, pay more than 50% of their income toward rent. And then the last point as we look forward, and again, um, um, uh, Santa Clara Housing Authority mentioned this, they're able to provide 17,000 people uh, with, with some kind of housing because of federal subsidies. As, as we look forward, we are at risk of losing 429,000 units of affordable housing from the feds in, in just uh, uh, Santa Clara. Uh, 30,000 of that, uh, those units in Santa Clara County, uh, which is only second to Los Angeles. So we've, we've got a stake in what's happening at the federal government. So with that, I'm going to start with you, uh, uh, Scott, Senator Wiener. And you know, you've got your, uh, a bill, SB 35. Uh, in full disclosure, uh, the Community Foundation is a strong supporter of that bill. Uh, tell why we need that and, and what it's trying to do. Sure. Uh, great. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, for having me today. And uh, I, I uh, even though the morning commute from San Francisco to Mountain View is not easy, um, I, I actually really I, I like to come down uh, here whenever I can, uh, in part and because uh, San Francisco and Silicon Valley, th this region is so interconnected. And uh, we all have this tendency, we do it in San Francisco, it happens all over the region, uh, that we look inward and we sort of act as if we are our own island and we're not. And so the decisions that Mountain View and Palo Alto and San Jose make affect San Francisco and vice versa. Oakland and San Francisco deeply impact each other. And so the more we're having regional housing and transportation conversations, uh, the better. Uh, and I, you know, I moved to San Francisco in uh, 1997 when I was 27 years old into the Castro, uh, and I uh, rented uh, a one-bedroom apartment in the heart of the Castro with a view of the Oakland Hills, uh, and I could not believe how much I was paying. It was just, I moved from the East Coast, I could not believe it. I was paying 1050 a month uh, for that top story, spacious, one bedroom uh, apartment with a view of the Oakland Hills, two blocks from Castro and Market. Uh, you laugh, even, and uh, that would be a $3,000 minimum apartment today. I would not be able to move 
uh, into the Castro as a young gay man, and I worry about the next generation. And uh, I spent six years on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors uh, during a very explosive time in San Francisco, uh, and uh, working with people who were being evicted, uh, single parents with children, seniors, et cetera, people becoming homeless, people being pushed out of the city, is a very, very personal issue for me, in addition to just something that we need to address. Uh, and so um, when I went was elected to the Senate last November, I promised my constituents that I, we would work on housing. Uh, and last year, you may recall, the governor proposed his uh, so-called buy right um, housing proposal, and it caused just this tsunami explosion, whatever you want to call it, and a huge coalition came together and killed it. Um, but I give the governor, and there, were, and there were, it was an imperfect uh, proposal, there were some issues with it. My view was that we should work with the governor to try to make it better rather than just kill it, but it, it died. But I give the governor enormous credit for calling the question that housing is not a city by city issue. It is a statewide crisis. Uh, and when you look, it's not just here in Southern California, the Inland Empire, the apartment vacancy rate is now lower than Los Angeles. This is spreading across the state. It is a statewide problem. And so SB 35, um, the housing bill that, I've, um, that I'm currently authoring, uh, is basically saying that we need to have accountability in terms of local communities stepping up and producing housing at all income levels. Uh, that it is no longer tenable to pretend that each city or town exists in a vacuum, uh, and they, people, it's no longer tenable for communities to decide we're not doing housing, we're not doing low-income housing, or we're going to put up a six-unit uh, housing development and then pat ourselves on the back and talk about what a great job we're doing, uh, that it has to be an issue of state concern. And what SB 35 does is it says, the Regional Housing Needs Assessment, RENA, every eight years, every single municipality in California gets a number. This is how many housing units you're supposed to produce in the coming years at different income levels. Right now, it just sits on a shelf and collects dust. There is no teeth in it. Some communities, I'm not disparaging all, there are communities that try very, very hard to meet RENA. There are other communities that don't. Uh, and what SB 35 will do is to say, if you are meeting your RENA goals, if you're on track to meet your RENA goals, by income category, Godspeed. Local control is about how you meet your housing goals, not whether. If you're not meeting your goals, then a streamlining process will kick in. And what that means is that if someone comes along and says, we're proposing a project that is within zoning, that becomes a ministerial permit. You can do design review on it for a set period of time. You can't do seven years worth of design review to pound that project into the ground. But if that project is within zoning, uh, you can't put them through some lengthy pro process that increases their costs, that turns it from a 40-unit project into a 12-unit project, and so forth. Um, we have labor protections in there. We require prevailing wage, which is now a topic of controversy because there are developers, uh, including some in the affordable housing community, who say prevailing wage is too much. It makes the project too expensive. There are folks in labor who are fighting us on it, saying it's not enough. You need to require uh, skilled and trained labor, which is a, basically a project labor agreement. So we're having that conversation. Um, but w you know, we are um, trying to work through a, a workable solution. Um, the League of Cities is opposing the bill, and that's fine. There, you know, that's. I, I was going to get to that. We so all play just, our role. A, so, so, Senator, uh, but I'm that gonna, is what I'm the gonna, bill does. I, I'm going to pause you there, and 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 move to Paul and Carolyn because I saw at points you nodding, and at parts not nodding, <laughs> and and so to start, because I'm going to let you talk about the not not the not nodding part, but to start. Philosophically, are you opposed, or are you opposed to specifics? Philosophically, the statement that, look, there are goals. There's some communities that are working earnestly at those goals. There are other communities that just don't move those goals at all. 
should there be some mechanism when communities have made statements to move goals forward and they just, they just sit? Or is it, it the ph philosophically, if they want them to sit, let it sit forever? We can get to the mechanics of the, of the, of the, of the stuff, but on the, phil on the philosophy that the center expressed, where did the two of you and your organizations stand? This is the easy stuff to start out with. Is this, is this the first step? Yeah. This is the first step? Yeah. This is my first visit to Palo Alto. And your the Mountain Peninsula, View, welcome. And the Peninsula <laughs> Division. There you go, Palo Mountain View. Thanks, thanks, Seth. Help me out there. Um, and I hope to be invited back. You will. <laughs> And, and Senator, um, pleasure to meet you, to meet you again. Um, I, I think we can all agree that there are some communities who are doing more and being more proactive in uh, trying to address this issue in their communities than there are in others. I think the, you know, from the League of Cities perspective, I think the challenge is, these are great words, accountability. I'm all for accountability, but accountability without resources leaves our local communities holding an empty bag. Um, and so um, I look forward to, as the session continues, um, opportunities to work with the senator and, and all the others who, are, who have introduced legislation um, this session to address this problem. I think it's good news that so many see it as a problem. But I think um, at, at the local level, uh, where the rubber meets the road, Accountability without resources to help um, increase the production of not only affordable housing, but housing in our communities um, is, is a bit of an empty promise. No, I just, Paul? I think it's, it's on. on. It's on, yeah. it's on. Um, I would just like to back up a second. Yeah. And because uh, you, you talked about philosophy, mm -hmm. and I, I, I look at solutions that are, that are being proposed and we're, we're trying to three three principles uh, the, I think the uh, what was the theme of this can we agree on something or something yeah. like that was what <laughs> is, is there can we find a way to agree um, and and I see because I, I really believe we've we've spent 40 years digging this hole that's made it very difficult for us to respond to the marketplace you mm -hmm. appropriately d declared that we've got a demand increase and we and we have so many hurdles to get supply to respond to that. As developers, you know we don't have a monopoly on land or capital, mm -hmm. so we have to try to respond to demand right. and and not lead it, if you will. But um, so I look at I look at kind of three things that our solutions should be long term in nature, which I, uh, that, that part of it I think uh, the senator's proposal is good. Uh, another one is it's got to be all sectors of the. Uh, of the economy, and in terms of, uh, not all sectors of the economy, all sectors of the housing spectrum, which his proposal does, which I, I think is really good. The thing that, that I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant in is that everybody's gotta, play, everybody's gotta play and everybody's gotta pay. And right now, what we're seeing is the only people paying a, a, for this are the good philanthropic corporations and builders who are, who are saddling the inclusionary fees or impact fees, development impact fees. There isn't a broad, spectrum in our society that's helping to pay those costs. Mm -hmm. That's why I, I, the, I think the fairest version for, for affordable housing is a low-income housing tax credit because it's become a societal problem, a statewide problem, and that spreads the burden a bit. Um, uh, but I don't see labor at the table here, um, and, I, and I think we also need to agree on what has caused the problem. Mm -hmm. I will give you my, what I think that has caused the problem is incremental use of, frank, inclusionary is one thing because it raises our costs. Um, if you tax anything, we had two bills on, uh, on the ballot last year, a cigarette tax and a soda tax, and you do that because you want to discourage use, and yet we tax housing and think we're gonna get more of it. You get less of it as, w w when you tax something, so it's not a good policy. But as builders, we know that, that um, there are people out, out in the world that are hurting, uh, particularly if you're a renter and, and you're on a fixed income or a limited income, your rent's going up five, 10% a year, you don't have an alternative to fight that. And that, that, that is something that I think all of us share in. And as builders, I look and I, I get sometimes kicked in the shin by my fellow members saying, you know, the inclusionary is just, you know, it's like it or not, it's, it's 
we've, we've lost that battle, but at the same time, we've got to contribute to the solution. And it may be imperfect, but that's political compromise. A lot of times it is imperfect. So how can we use that and use our brains and our skills to pr produce more housing and work with folks to do that? That's why I'm here today, to try to do that. So, um, what, so I want to see everybody's got to play. That means every city's got to play, and I commend what Mountain View is doing, I, I really do. You guys are, are a model. Um, and what it's done to your downtown and the vibrancy and the quality of life in your city is, is amazing. And I, and I talk so, to other so cities. So, Paul, I'm going to... Yeah, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Give me banana. Yeah. Uh, is, uh, so anyway, so I support in a lot of principle. I would like to see there's a couple of key issues that are, that are real problematic. How Rena is set, I don't like the top down, and I don't think it's accurate. Neither mm -hmm. does the... Does the um, uh, LAO th think that RENA numbers are accurate, and we should fix the prevailing wage determination because it is it is not workable throughout the state and not accurate throughout the state. You fix those two things, and I think it's a really work a, a, a good a great start and could be long term. Mm -hmm. Assembly Member uh, Carver. Well, thank you, and uh, I want to thank uh, Senator Weiner for. Uh, taking a leadership role. This is not an easy issue to come in as a freshman senator to, to take on an issue like this. And uh, we know um, that, I mean, everyone I think agrees that we do need more housing and we certainly need more affordable housing. And um, all these issues are connected. But when it comes to, as the senator indicated, the cities being connected with one another, the, the regional issues and the pressures, and including the transportation network as well. It probably took me almost as long to get here from South San Jose as it took Senator Weiner to get here from San Francisco, right? Um, but I, I, do, I do agree with the senator in that having allocations without any teeth is just for show. Uh, when I was on ABAG and we see all these allocations and oh great, you know, San Jose or San Francisco gets an A grade, great, what does that mean? Some other city gets a D or an F and there's no consequence. And so we definitely need to have some ability um, to put some, put some downward pressure on jurisdictions that refuse um, to build any housing. And, and we see this NIMBY movement in terms of not just showing up at council meetings and all that, but putting measures on the ballot that are making it harder and harder for people like Mary Rosenberg that wants to do the right thing to do the right thing. We see this happening in cities throughout the state, in L.A., in smaller jurisdictions, up and down the peninsula. And so I think that's where you're seeing the governor and others like Senator Weiner saying, look, you know, we, we have to, first of all, commend those that are doing the right thing uh, and, and allow them to continue to have that local control. But if, if others refuse to build housing, when you have uh, most of the affordable housing stock in, throughout the Silicon Valley being built in San Jose, and finally, I think we're starting to, in the recent years, we're seeing emerging leadership from cities like Mountain View, which is fantastic, but even then, it's been so hard for them to do it. And I've watched how hard it is. And then you have other cities that refuse, essentially basically say, we don't want to grow anymore. Well, that's not acceptable. It's absolutely not acceptable, especially when it comes to housing. Um, we have to come to the conclusion as a community, as a region, as a state, that housing is a right. And if housing, everyone is, uh, if that's, if we both truly believe that in principle, then all of us together that are up here have to figure out how to get there. And I think that the conversation by buy right is an important one to have to move us along the way. So, uh, Carolyn, you give me that look like you got to say something. So say something. Then I'm gonna let the it. Senate, and then, and then I'm gonna let the Since Senate. Since I now have a, a recognize that I and, am in. Um, Palo Alto and not. Mountain View. You're yeah. Mountain View. <laughs> Mountain View. Keep me here until I get it right. <laughs> you know what? I had such a short drive here because I was <laughs> in Palo Alto um, last night. I think it's important to remember, you know, we talk about the cities as if they are a they. We talk about local governments as if they are a they. I think um, both of our elected representatives up here today are doing what they believe represents the will of the people and the voters in their communities. And so those cities that we talk about that are doing or aren't doing, through their local elected officials, they too believe they are representing the will of the people who vote in their communities. I think we just can't lose track of the fact that when we talk about cities want something or don't want something, um, we're really talking about 
the community um, and, and the residents. Um, and I, I, just, I just think it's important to, to make part of this conversation a personal, a, it's a personal one. And uh, what we see in our communities, what is working, what is not working. It's, a, it's about, I'm gonna say it's about us. That's kind of what, what today is about. Sorry. Can, can, I, can I add one quick comment on that? Yes. Because uh, it, it takes leadership. And, and, and the reason why I bring that up, it takes elected leadership because it's never easy anywhere to build. When someone, no, neighbors never come up and say, yes, we want more development right next to us. No one, I've never seen an affordable housing project where the community wants it. It's taken elected leadership to stand up and say, you know, this is why we need this and to do it in, in a constructive manner. If we just... I, at first I, at first sight, if we just said, you know what, the, the neighborhood doesn't want us, we're just not going to do it, we would get zero housing built and certainly zero affordable housing. So I do think that it, you're 100% you're correct in that it's easy for me from San Jose and, and Scott from San Francisco to say, well, why don't these cities just build more housing? Why don't they just build more affordable? I get it's not as simple as that if you're in the smaller jurisdictions. I, I totally do. But I also think that we can't simply just say, well, just do what the community wants. Uh, because at the end of the day, we are here not just for our self-preservation today, but we have to be looking to the next generation. And sometimes that takes political risk and leadership to do that, uh, at, at risk to the actual elected official at times. So, Senator, I'm going to let you have a wrap-up, and then I'm going to wrap us up and move us on. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, I, I want to just... Um, I, I mean, I, and I agree that ultimately the cities are us. We're all... You know, we're all residents, representatives, and we're all accountable. Uh, but we do, I think there is uh, a real challenge, and, and Ash, I think, really captured one of them that, uh, you know, I find this is not just a small city thing. In San Francisco, you know, when I was on the Board of Supervisors representing Castro, Noe Valley, Glen Park, parts of the Mission, we had, we, we built quite a bit of housing along, for example, Upper Market Street, and there were people who were just apoplectic that we were putting six-story buildings along Market Street, a transit hub. And, <laughs> and yeah, and, and we just, you know, there some, they tried to pass a moratorium on new housing in the mission. And I, I really vocally opposed it and I got beaten up real badly on that. So I think it does, you know, there are these internal conversations within cities. And, and I want to say, I, I think sometimes, not so much talking about the elections, but the, the process, uh, you know, in SP35, one of the, piece of pushback we've gotten, not just from the league, but from others, is we need to have all these hearings. We need to have you know, he these hearings and approving projects. And I'm all for public participation. I'm all for public participation. But I think we're f kidding ourselves if we think that many of the hearings that happen around projects are vaguely representative of the broad spectrum of the community. They're absolutely not. And I've been through many, many, many of these hearings. And these hearings do not look like our broad community, you know, in terms of who has the time to go, who is able to go, who has childcare duty and so they can't go, or they're at work, or they're just 25 years old and, and they're getting completely screwed on housing for their future. But they don't even know the hearing is happening. Uh, it, is the, this is not, it is not democratic in terms of how we're doing these land use approvals right now. It's the opposite. Um, but I, I do want to, um, just a couple of quick things. Um, in terms of, you, say, you know, um, an empty promise, I agree 100%. We're not doing enough to fund affordable housing. The federal government is missing in action, uh, and it's going to get worse as tax cuts come in and the tax credits become worse, worth less. It's a problem. The state does not do enough. We're trying to get some bills passed, and I'm co opting and we're all supporting them. But even with those bills, it's not going to be as much as we need. So we need to do more for these uh, housing subsidies, absolutely. Uh, and no one is suggesting that each city should be in it alone to fund its housing. But we're talking about when we have projects that come forward where the land is secured, where the funding is there, where everything is there, and it is still too hard to get it approved. And when it comes to market rate housing or market rate with inclusionary, that doesn't require any resources from the cities other than a planning department. Uh, and those projects are getting held up. So yes, we have to do more for resources, uh, but, we, but the part of the problem 
is that it is just way, way, way too hard to get housing at any income level approved in many parts of the state, uh, even if it is with 100% within zoning. And then finally, in terms of RENA, um, if there's one thing that I've discovered in SP35, because we do key off of RENA, if there's one thing I've discovered, if there's one thing that everyone agrees on, is that no one likes RENA. <laughs> Many of the cities will say, these numbers are way too high. We can never achieve them. Many housing advocates will say, these numbers are ridiculously low. And, and so everyone hates it. And I suspect that any numerical, any goal system we set up, there, everyone would still hate it for one reason or another. But, but it's what we have. And we should have a conversation about how we make Rena better. But for now, it's what we have. And, 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 it's, and it's just not enforceable. We, we just want to have better accountability around it. Great. So a number of you have mentioned the importance of financing around the housing, right? And there are different ways uh, to, to finance this. And Paul, you were talking about a way that you would want to promote as a, as, as a way. Say more about uh, the, the tax credit that you were Sorry. It is, um, and and I don't have any magic solutions other than I've been in finance and real estate for 40 years and starting as a banker and, and then moving into development. And so much of what we do is financially related because it's so capital intensive. Um, in San Francisco, if you're, it's cost almost $1,000 a square foot to build a new unit, and it's getting um, you know three quarters of that cost down here in the South Bay. Um, and that takes a lot of capital. Some, uh, I think ABAG thinks that we're a hundred thousand dollar, a hundred thousand units short in very low and low income housing. Well, to build that at a half a million uh, dollars a unit for Bay Area prices, that's fifty billion dollars that needs to be raised in the form of debt and equity. And and so that what. What I'd like to see is, and, and if you're an affordable developer, you know that you have to go out and try to raise bank capital, but also this tranches of equity from foundations and otherwise uh, low-income housing tax credit and the like, and it's hard to cobble it together when your costs are that high. And so why I'm hoping this dialogue will lead to over time is more of us collaborating on our long-term goal, how many units we need to produce, market rate, senior, you know, uh, assisted living to very low, low, moderate, you know, middle income, because middle income folks seem to be left out of all the conversations, and um, how many we need for, for this region, and collectively say, and, and set targets, because we can, with, with a vision like that, when you're going out to raise capital, you need a vision, and you need people to believe in your mission, and if they're in it for a financial return, you need to be able to describe to them what that financial return is, or if it's a sense of good, you need to get the message out like the movie that we just saw and things that will happen on the SV at Home website to, to why they're doing this. And, and this is your, you know, the, the psychic income, if you will, from, from doing good. And lay those things out. And it's got to be state, local, federal level. Um, I don't think the Bay Area, and I, and I credit what you guys are doing, um, has done a very good job of getting together to attack the federal government. We're the largest state. we got the most representatives there, and I think it would be it probably is, is on us to try to arrange with them and to, uh, ourselves and say, let's go back and try to get these things uh, from, from the government. They'll look at us and say, from the feds, they'll, you know, elected representatives will say, you guys get together and then come to us and we'll help you. But until you get together, we can't really help you. So I, I, would, I, I, I respectfully suggest that this administration's focus is not on helping the Bay Area expand its housing, <laughs> but, but, uh, but, but, but Congress might. I mean, well, well, I'm not sure Congress would. Right? We've got 14 Republican senators that senators that are holding up uh, a transportation expansion in in the South Bay right now. That all it needs is a signature of the transportation secretary. Yeah. And that would help uh, move people, alleviate congestion, have uh, density in housing. And 14 California senators signed a letter, uh, represented congressmen, signed a letter saying, don't sign it. So I don't think they're representing California very well as opposed to party interests as an observation from a nonpartisan, nonpolitical <laughs> individual. But back to financing. Uh, so. 
So, Carolyn, you said it was okay, and there was really a point of agreement that I want to come back to. You said, look, it's okay if cities, to have accountability if cities aren't left with the financing. What do you see as the viable financing solution? So we need to bring back re the redevelopment fund that, that funneled. What, what, we want accountability, so how do we get cities the money that you said they needed? I don't think we can call it redevelopment, though. Okay, well, whatever Based we, on what give I've it observed. whatever label you want, but where. Now that I know I'm in Mountain View. Where, where, where does the, <laughs> where, where would you, where would the league say well the revenue that. ought to come from that then we could ask for the accountability that you agree we should have? Well, I think there are, um, the league is, is supporting, I know that might be news to some of you, uh, but the, the league is supporting um, a couple of bills in the, in the state legislature today, SB2 and SB3, mm -hmm. that would um, allocate some resources to help support affordable housing and the affordability of housing um, um, in, in California. Say a word about SB3, just um, SB3 is a $3 billion um, housing bond. Mm -hmm. uh, Senator Bell is a uh, lead sponsor on that. And then SB2, which is uh, sponsored by um, uh, Senator Atkins, um, is a $75 fee that would get imposed on some um, uh, documents associated with, with the transaction. Um, not nearly enough. The gap is big, mm -hmm. um, but, but they're a start. Um, I have suggested to folks that um, and I've heard a lot in the four months that I've been in California about redevelopment and the saga of redevelopment and what happened. Uh, we are a long way from filling the vacuum that um, um, the elimination of that tool has created. Um, and so um, as, as the League of California Cities, we certainly look forward to working with um, our partners at the state level um, on some uh, new options in the future. Uh, to, to fill some of that some of that void. I did want to say to um, my friend here, um, Paul, in terms of the feds and the low income housing tax credit, perhaps uh, California cannot be the lead in, in um, trying to increase that allocation, but there are 49 other states um, that the league works with closely um, that we hope will help lead the charge not only on the tax credits, but on the community development block grant program that is so important, on the housing voucher program, um, and other portions of Section 8 um, that are so important um, to the work of our housing authorities. Um, you know, we continue to see a, a, a strand in Washington that says um, disinvestment in not only our transportation infrastructure network, and also our housing network. and. Um, uh, I think we, one of the things we can do is work together to try to push back on some of those. And it is a nationwide, it is a nationwide challenge. Senator, assembly member thoughts on SB3 or SB2? And is it enough? Is it the right direction? Is it setting the right start? Or is it going in the wrong direction? Uh, well, I'm a co-author on both bills. <laughs> so it's so, going in the right direction. So I do, yeah. So it's is right it enough? I'm holding my it's, breath. It's it's the right direction, and uh, is it enough? I I mean no, it's it's not enough. I I actually did a uh, sort of back of the envelope calculation of how many units these two bills over time are likely to produce, and I made some assumptions about cost, which is so variable in the state, and um, and about and not all not all of the money is going to go to new construction. There are other needs, of course, uh, but even if it, with what it produces and uh, you and accessing the federal tax credit if it remains viable um, I, I think we're looking at you know over uh, you know 10 15 year period um, maybe 60 70 80 thousand uh, new units of housing um, that might be a little optimistic but I think it's possible uh, and that's awesome that's 60 70 80 thousand you know, families that will have homes that wouldn't have had homes otherwise. That's awesome. Even for just just looking at low income, that is, it, there, there's the need is so much greater. And then we haven't even gotten to the middle class. And that's why I think, that, and this has been, um, I think, an unfortunately contentious part of the housing debate. I'm a huge supporter of what we, you know, when we say affordable housing, subsidized income-based below market rate housing that we have to have that, especially for low-income people. 
by itself, housing subsidies, there, we will never have enough of them to completely solve the problem, even for low-income people, but particularly for the middle class. And that's why overall housing supply, and that means market rate developers, people love to beat the heck out of market rate developers, uh, but without that market rate housing, in addition to the below market rate subsidized housing, we're never going to solve the problem. The two have to happen hand in hand. And unfortunately, I think there are a lot of affordable housing people who truly and deeply get that. And I'm very appreciative of that. There are some advocates who basically don't want to have any market rate housing. And we are shooting ourselves in the foot if we don't have more market rate housing. Assembly member. Yeah, I, I, I support both of those bills, uh, and I also have one that I'm joint authoring with the Senate member, David Chu, is AB71, uh, which is another potential source of, uh, of, of income for resources for affordable housing. But even with that one, all three together, it's still a part of what would be needed in terms of the overall state need. And um, there, there's no doubt we need um, all three of those plus some. And uh, as, as was mentioned earlier, what the county did with Measure A, right? We lo Local jurisdictions, local counties are going to have to look at opportunities for themselves to self-fund, especially given the fact that it's been referred to a few times that we're gonna, we, we should count on less and less from the federal government. Uh, so I think that does put a greater burden on the state to find more uh, resources, especially because, you know, and I just saw the tweet, 18,000 affordable homes have been built in San Jose. Uh, and, you know, a lot of that, a lot of, a lot of the success, especially when Mary Gonzalez was there, and of course we have Leslie Corsilia who did a fantastic job as our housing director in San Jose as well. Um, with the redevelopment agency, you know, some jurisdictions took advantage of it in, in different ways. I think, you know, San Jose certainly took advantage of the redevelopment funds to create uh, affordable housing using prevailing wage labor, by the way, and uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, but now we just we don't we're not gonna we don't have that gap filled, even with all three of these bills, including the bond, and then it comes down to whether the governor will sign it. And you know, if you look at the conversations and and the uh, the advocacy for SB one, the transportation bill, which was I think was a great win in terms of the other piece, the transportation piece, and creating you know tens of thousands of jobs. Um, part of his rationale is look, we got to we have to pay as we go. And he advocated against bonding, and he uh, uh, off, oftentimes advocated against bonding. So um, even if it gets to the governor's desk, will he sign it? I, I don't know. And so that's why we have to have more than one tool, more than one bill going forward, because at the end of the day, we don't know how many are going to survive all the way through the gauntlet to get to the governor's desk and then be signed. And then even, if, even then, knowing we still have way more needs. What one of the... Uh really challenging problems, particularly in the Silicon Valley slash San Francisco Bay Area, is that uh, one community can decide on its own to say, wow, wonderful, we're going to attract this huge corporation, it's going to have a major campus, have a huge footprint of tens of thousands of people, and we're going to get the corporate tax revenue that comes from having this this company here, but we have no obligation to provide for the housing or the transportation congestion. And so how do we create a framework, right? Once, you know, it reminds me of the old story, Carolyn, of people, uh, two people in a boat and they're facing each other. And one person pulls out one of those old hand drills that my dad used to use. And the person says, stop drilling in the boat. And they say, be quiet, I'm on my side of the boat. So cities can say, I'm doing my own thing on my side of the boat, but really at some level, we're all in the boat together. So what can be done because I, it, cities are making individual decisions that have huge implications for their neighbors and for the regional health? What are the strategies? to get at that, recognizing, yes, you want every locality to do its own thing, but we're in a bigger boat together. Who'd like to take that on? SB 335, is that the one? 35. Yeah, SB 35. I think that's what he's trying. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's what the senator is trying to address. I, I, think that's, I think that's part of it, but I do think it does get into broader issues of the tax structure in California uh, that we have, because of Prop 13, um, we have de-emphasized uh, property taxes and 
really emphasized you know, income taxes on high earners, which we can't, there are no local income taxes in California, although we do have business taxes, um, but also uh, sales tax. And so there is a strong incentive for communities to build shopping centers, commercial development, uh, rather than uh, um, uh, residential. And even though the Prop 13 reform that we're looking at, that we talked about, we'll see if it moves forward, is the, the split role to take commercial property out of uh, Prop 13, even if that were to happen, and it, that is a very, very, very heavy lift. Um, and just to understand, over the years since we started Prop 13, we shifted the tax burden. It used to be about 60, 65 percent was on corporations and the remainder on uh, homeowners. And in that period of time, it's completely shifted where 60, 65 yeah. percent now is on homeowners because you don't turn over a corporate campus to reevaluate it. So the the tax is heavily now burdened on homeowners. Right. So, yeah. And my and I, my concern is that I'm a supporter of split role, but if we do split role, that'll be positive in many ways, but it will it could create even more incentive for communities to do commercial and not residential. So it, it is a conundrum. I don't see the residential portion of Prop 13 changing anytime soon. Uh, but because of that, it makes it even more important for us to create other incentives to counterbalance that incentive. So others on how do we get everybody to see themselves in the same boat and manage that? Um, I'd go back to a term we heard earlier, leadership. The other thing I'd say is you can't, you can't be a star, thriving, great city in a region that's dying. I mean, so 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 inherently, um, I, I think there's there's some sense at the local level that there would have to be some level, or will need to be some level of uh, collaboration and cooperation. Um, I lived in uh, Indianapolis for many years, and uh, worked in local government there. Worked in mayor's office, and the structure there within the county, there were nine different townships that all had some version of their own uh, governmental framework, although we were a consolidated city-county form of government. From an economic development perspective, now living in a nine-county region, from an economic development perspective, what we often found happening was companies would just move around the county. Who was, and, and, and they would pit county against county um, in terms of the economic development uh, incentives. One of the smartest things that the political leadership in those nine counties decided to do was to create a regional economic development structure so that they're at least not, and it was not perfect, you all know it was not going to be perfect, but at least there was some sense up front about coordination and a collaboration in terms of what the incentives were uh, that were, were um, being negotiated. Um, so I would suspect that again, and at the local level, local leaders, civic, business, and um, um, government uh, tend to be uh, quite innovative and that creatures of, um, despite its very nature, that they will come together. We've got a number of just fantastic questions here, so this is what I, I'd like to propose. Uh, I'm gonna read one of the questions. Whoever feels a burning interest to answer, and then if someone says, that really hate that response, and I wanna respond or add something in support, and then we'll sort of try to do it that way. Uh, and if all of you want to chime in, it's great. So one question is, uh, would you support raising the threshold for any growth measures? Uh, and it goes on to say, so that a community can only stop uh, truly detrimental projects and not just uh, stop growth constraints. And there is actually, uh, there's a bill in the legislature now by Assemblymember Miguel Santiago of uh, Los Angeles, who's fantastic. I think I adore him. Um, and he's great on housing and a lot of issues. Um, and what it would, it would be a constitutional amendment, so it would have to go to the voters. It needs a two-thirds vote of the legislature, then goes to the voters. It's a pretty heavy lift that would uh, require um, for these sort of no growth, growth restriction, et cetera, types of ballot measures, a two-thirds vote. And I think it came out of the fires of Measure S in Los Angeles, where a, um, uh, a really bad actor in LA by the name of Michael Weinstein 
um, uh, put this ballot measure on. That's just would have it was defeated, um, and so uh, this required two thirds vote. I'm uh, I'm a little conflicted about it, even because I have been a sort of outspoken critic of Californians' two thirds sort of obsession to raise taxes two thirds, to voter to pass a bond two thirds, and trying to lower that threshold. So I haven't taken a position on it yet. I I I, I, I like what the sentiment is behind it. I just have to figure out mm -hmm. uh, whether it's the right path. Anyone else want to respond to that? No? OK. So how can we further incentivize cities to allow for increased housing even beyond their local share? For example, San Jose has more housing than jobs, and there is some opposition to adding more housing, even where it makes sense over concerns about cost of city services. Maybe allow local income tax collection from residents? Uh, I, well, one of the things with San Jose is, because I do agree that you know, when we're talking about, uh, to the prior question, you, know, you have other cities that have been building these big corporate campuses and becoming kind of the, the, the Silicon Valley hubs, and, and San Jose, although of course, you know, it also has a, a lot of technology there uh, in, in terms of our presence. Also, initially in the creation of Silicon Valley, it became that bedroom community. And so we're trying to reverse engineer mistakes that were made in the past in terms of transportation um, and roadway uh, infrastructure, in terms of having these miles after miles, a single family detached home that now we can't do anything about. I don't think the answer is, strictly, is simply just to say, well, just don't build any more housing because we need the jobs. Um, I, I think that we have to be more creative in how we bring more housing and jobs together. We've seen some successes in doing that in San Jose, along North First Street, West San Carlos, certainly in downtown. Uh, but I think that we, if we had the opportunity to do both, I'm all for it. And I, and I, I think whenever you have a strict rule that just says, okay, no more housing, no, because you know I've, I've been critical of cities that say, well, we just want more housing. I, I think that San Jose should not also play into those games and say, well, we're just not going to build any more housing. However, we have to be also realistic about, because of what Senator Weiner had said, you know, the reality is that if we're relying on the volatility of sales tax and, and other things, what have you, then there is that incentive to bring more jobs into our community. Uh, but I don't think, I think we need to do a case-by-case -case analysis. There are places that are zoned for jobs where it would make sense to build housing or at the very least do mixed use. And I think we have to keep our mind open to that uh, because right now the last thing we need to do is completely close ourselves off to the opportunity of building housing. There are a number of questions here about parking. Uh, and and uh, one uh, person writes, how can cities encourage less parking to bring down costs of building housing and help uh, the health of our communities? Are there any incentives we can create that remove uh, production barriers, incentives that don't involve new fees or taxes? Uh, well, I, I'm proud of the fact that this la last year, we, for the first time in San Jose, approved a project that had zero parking allocated to it. And I think that was fantastic. And again, it was close to the Caltrain, to Deer Dawn Station. I mean, it has to be in the right places. But I think any opportunity we had to reduce the number of parking spaces, and, let's, and we had to start thinking about the future. The reality is that we know that less and less people are buying vehicles or relying on vehicles for everyday use. Uh, we're not quite like San Francisco yet, where many of my friends don't have vehicles because they just don't need it. We're way more spread out. We're 180 square miles, and then add on the rest of Santa Clara County in terms of people getting to and from. But that's why we're building up. That's why we, we, we support Calgary. That's why we're building out our BART infrastructure and our light rail and our connectivity is to give people the opportunity to not have a vehicle. And I'm all for opportunities to provide incentives so that builders can focus their building on creating more units, more homes, and less on building more and more space for parking spots. And when we think about vehicle automation, and we think about the transit networks we're creating, there's gonna be less and less need for those spots. And we're finding now there are empty parking garages and parking lots all over this state. If you look at shopping centers, you have just, you know, if you cumulatively miles and miles of empty, wasted space. So we've got to get right out Future of the 20th housing century. Opportunities. What's that? Future housing opportunities. Uh, exactly. And you're 100% right. That's 100% right. Um, we have to get out of the 20th century model of how we build, and um, uh, and, and Paul's 100% right. We're looking at the urban village um, in our 2040 plan for San Jose, and one of the places in, uh, we have Sergio Jimenez here from District 2, so right on the border of District 2, 
on Boss Mill and Snell, we have a VTA stop there, and we have this huge shopping center, and that's one of the spots that's been identified to build housing with retail on the bottom. And so we're again, that's part of our reverse engineering. But it's going to there are going to be a lot of growing pains, a lot of community opposition at first. But ultimately, we have to reduce the number of parking spaces. And I think with technology and with our new urban growth model, we have the opportunity to do that. And we, we, I would just add, we will also have some opportunities as, as the traditional retail space of, of going to malls is, is contracting uh, how to repurpose those buildings in, in useful ways. Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything that Ash just said, but I, I think it's also important to be clear that um, there, that minimum parking requirements that cities impose at times, especially severe ones, are uh, not only that is a bad policy, but it is uh, at times, a, I think, an, a deliberate obstruction to housing because it does significant. If you have it too high, you're going to reduce the amount of housing. Uh, and I think sometimes, sometimes that's intentional. And there have been some changes in state yeah, law absolutely. to put constraints on that. Yeah. So two, two uh, questions, uh, they're at the same issue, but coming at it from, from different ways. One says, uh, building affordable housing is a goal that helps a number of people that, that otherwise couldn't afford uh, housing, but how do those, those uh, efforts help people who are homeless? Why can't we establish sanctioned uh, encamp encampments? And another question reads, how can market rate housing serve middle income people and rather than luxury housing or investment slash vacation homes who wants to take that a a ab 71 deals with the vacation home issue because what it does and this has been again i'm joint authoring with david chu but it would remove the tax credit for a second home not for an investment property but there are folks like we may get a vacation home in tahoe what have you and i i would agree that uh, it's less important to incentivize that than to actually use those funds for affordable housing. And I don't want to take up all the time, but on the, the first part of the question, I've been very publicly supportive of sanctioned encampments. And the reason why is that until we have enough housing for everyone, we have encampments. Let's not pretend we don't. And so rather, let's provide safer venues for it where, where, where social services can come to those that have the needs, get them on list, get, get them vouchers, know, that, know where they are, and that they're at least minimally cared for in that environment, as difficult as it can be, rather than just moving encampments around and shutting them down and having them pack up their belongings. And you know, the, I, we've been, as a society, as a community, I, I think we have not um, been responsible enough in making sure there's enough housing for everyone. Now we're doing and taking some great steps, Measure A and others, to make sure that we're providing transitional housing, but it's not going to happen overnight. And so since we know it's not going to happen overnight, I do support opportunities to make sure that people are in safe communities, even if that is an encampment community. Paul, what do builders think about encampments? If, uh, if, if you have a view. Um, other, other than we, we, I think we share everybody else's uh, opinion is that they're uh, they're really unfortunate and um, we don't think they're good for the community it's not certainly not good for any of the residents but it's not good for the whole neighborhood and um, and so um, we are you know we, we would like to support more of the uh, the homeless shelters and the like it, it's not something that there's that there's a market rate uh, motivation for because I don't think anybody's figured out uh, that formula, cracked that nut yet. But um, I know the Sobratos, who've made a lot of money in real estate and in their foundation, have tried to give back recently uh, with a 200-unit proposal somewhere down here. I forget which jurisdiction. And, and it, uh, it met with a furor of uh, we don't want that and those people in our neighborhood. So back to, you know, Carol and I were talking about, uh, you know, the conversation that you know, some of these problems are truly really kind of human nature and us collectively have, have uh, you know, have a reaction to those, those things. And it's back to leadership and changing the, the, the dialogue that, um, you know, I was on a panel last, last year at Silicon Valley Leadership Group, the, the head of the uh, San Jose House, uh, Homeless uh, Initiative was with us and she finished her remarks by saying, um, all housing is good, more is better because she saw that we needed more supply everywhere and that would, that would help those at the homeless level too. Um, and that's, yeah. you know, I don't have a magic answer, but, yeah. but uh, 
we're, not, we're, we're certainly supportive of, of, of those things. Um, almost need to go back to uh, you know, some things that Leslie was talking about, Don Turner used to lead with is, if they're attractively built, we can prove that they are additive to a neighborhood and not a detractor. And so we need to have those kind of dialogues with the, with the public. Yeah, the, the encampment issue is a, is a hard one. We've had wars in San Francisco about uh, the encampments, and um, especially in a place in San Francisco where we're all like right on top of each other. And um, the, the challenge that we've found in the encampments, even when I've gone out with our Department of Public Works at 4 a.m. when they do the cleaning crew, where they don't even move them around, they just say, can you move so we can like clean uh, around it? It's very challenging. The encampments quickly um, deteriorate in terms of you know the some of the major major public health uh, problems, safety problems in terms of women getting sexually assaulted, um, uh, you know people putting I mean, a propane tank in a tent or and and with a sanctioned camp, I think in theory I think it can be a really positive thing. I have yet to see or you know I. I tend to follow this nationally when cities do these sanctioned camps. They, even though they, the cities try really, really hard, they quickly, at some point, deteriorate. And, and, and then they end up being cleared out because the city decides it doesn't work. And so I don't know that we have yet developed a model for how that works. I do want to, in terms of the other issue, that question, it, it was really, it's an interesting one. It says, with all the, the new housing that's being built, the market, it's luxury housing, it's not for the middle class. And we hear that sometimes as an argument for don't build market rate housing. I'm not saying this person necessarily believes that, but some will take the next step because it's just all luxury housing. Well, there is some luxury housing. We have the, you know, the NEMA project or some other projects like in San Francisco where it's like, you know, I mean, the, all, every bell and whistle conceivable. Most of the new housing that is going up, I know at least in San Francisco and I think elsewhere, is not like that. It is simply housing. Uh, and yes, it's very expensive. I mean, new construction is always going to be more expensive. But let's be really, really clear that if you go and try to buy or rent a 75-year-old, um, not in particularly good shape, flat, that's also going to be at luxury housing prices. Everything is luxury housing in San Francisco and in the Bay Area right now, not because it's truly luxury housing, but because there's just not enough of it and the price is through the roof. And until we have enough housing, those prices are going to continue. Are, are we, one, another question, is it is it time for CEQA reform? Is CEQA being used too often to delay in ways that it, it wasn't intended to be used? And if so, how do, how do we get at it? Yeah, yes, and... <laughs> Yeah. Yes, and I don't know. Um, is, is the um, you know, I, I, Holland and Knight has done a, a really interesting study. Uh, that's a law firm out of San Francisco on uh, sequel lawsuits, and has found something like 83 percent of them have nothing to do with the environment, but are really from a, a different political agenda. Whether it's and 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 I, and sadly, the predominant amount of those are opposing urban infill housing projects and transit projects and transportation. So um, I don't know where um, exactly where to start, but I do know that that's part of the problem uh, because we, my, my, us and my member, fellow members, experience it daily. Um, yeah, I, I would I, echo I, oh, that. I, again, I've only been here a short time, but uh, CEQA comes up in every conversation I'm having, uh, be it with local officials, be it with developers, uh, be it with um, folks from the State House and in many other corners. So I'd say yes. Don't know the yeah, I, I think everyone, and especially those that have come from local government, know that secret reform is necessary, um, but it has to be done in a way that still maintains the underlying goal and purpose of CEQA, which is environmental protection. And so that's the challenge is how do you get there? Because there's no doubt that, yeah, there's it's used to kill developments because from neighbors or folks that don't want it or competing businesses. There's a famous case from San Jose where one gas station used CEQA to stop another gas station across the street, right? <laughs> And, and so, it is. yeah, and so it's being used in a way that wasn't necessarily intended, but that's that's the case often with oftentimes with many laws and regulations. However, I think in this case, I I do think that there's a way that we can go about reforming it. It'll be very difficult, and, and really, it's more of a modernization more than anything else. But it's going to be very challenging to have that debate. And I think now that 
you know, Scott and I are, are, are going to be around theoretically for a few years, I think, whether we like it or not, we're going to have to be part of that debate of trying to fix it because I certainly would like to, you know, in the next decade or so, actually have something done about it. But it's going to be very challenging. Again, another issue is going to take everyone up here and in, in, in the audience and more, uh, including the environmental community, uh, that, um, you know, those, those in the environmental community, I mean, if you're an environmentalist, you want more high-density housing. At least you should, in theory. And so you want transit. And then you want your open spaces remaining open. How do you keep your open spaces? There's one reason why I was very strongly against developing Coyote Valley, but also very strongly for higher density where we could build it. It's because that's how we keep Coyote Valley free from development, by building higher density where we can build. Um, uh, yes, we should always be having the conversation about CEQA. But I, I think, and I, I think CEQA reform is very doable, even though it has this perception that it's impossible. And one of the and there have been CEQA reforms. There are, every year there are bills that pass that take some things out of CEQA or streamline some things. But when, whenever any significant CEQA reform happens, the way, the pattern has been that the you know someone just moves forward and with a bill to just change everything and and the development community is behind the business community is behind it. And it's a huge war, and then labor and the environmental community rise up and kill it, and it just becomes this really unproductive thing. Um, in SP 35, even though the label on the bill is not CEQA reform, if a project is converted from discretionary to ministerial, which a streamlined project would be, it comes out of CEQA. It is no longer subject to CEQA. Uh, it's not a secret about the bill. It's been a subject of discussion at hearings. But guess what? The last hearing on the bill, the California Legal Conservation Voters and the Natural Resources Defense Council showed up at the hearing and said, we have not officially endorsed the bill but we like the direction of this bill and we support the environmental provisions because we worked with them early on. And so we said, okay, this, it's not going, the streamlining won't apply in the so-called coastal zones, a very sensitive right on the coast that the Coastal Commission oversees. It can't be used to streamline projects on prime farmland or open space. This is about compact infill housing, not covering open space. And we put in a series of amendments like that that don't really, um, I think that the developers are, are fine with um, and we all are fine with, uh, but it really addressed some of those concerns, and so they're now positive about the bill. Um, and even the Sierra Club, which is never going to support a bill like this, they, 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 they come to hearings and say they're opposed, but they have not been declaring war on the bill because we've been working with them too. So I think there are ways to make reforms if you do it in a collaborative, transparent way. I think that would be a huge move forward. Uh, and from what you described, maybe even a piece of low-hanging fruit, because that, that is getting in the way. And, and as I've spoken to some environmentalists, I've said you're undermining uh, what you really like to do when you're being used to subvert uh, affordable housing at a time when we're at epi an epic crisis. Uh, can we do a, I need someone who's, who's my timekeeper out there. So how much time do I have? We have? So I'm on track. So I'm in good shape then. I can I can open up. Oh, seven. I thought you said 17. Oh, I heard 17, so I'll keep with that. Thank you, Senator, very much. All right, now, now we can reverse everything the Senator said and... Uh, <laughs> SB 35 sequel reform. All right, it might even get the league. It might even get the league support, right? No. Uh, uh, we've got another question here. Uh, with both an increasing population regionally and an aging population regionally, what reasonable actions can be taken to guide the development of density, which takes this convergence into consideration? Uh, well, I'm, I'm one of the, in addition to being on the housing committee, I'm also chair of the Assembly Aging and Long-Term Care Committee. So it's definitely something that I've been thinking a lot about. Uh, I think some of the, the bills that have come forward, it's, some cities have certainly uh, been pushing on this as well, are the, um, the granny units, the kind of the, uh, allowing opportunities. Because if you think about in San Jose, we have so many neighborhoods that are just, they're there. They're, they're never going to go anywhere. You're talking about many, 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 you know, tens and tens of thousands of homes. 
Um, so being a little less restrictive as to how you can build extra units, that's how we create, I mean, how do we create more units in an existing neighborhood? That's one way to do it for certain. Um, and especially because we have more and more people taking care of the elderly at home, we know it's a better way for health results and outcomes for them to stay in the home. So if we allow the opportunity to kind of build within, kind of like infill development in your own uh, community, uh, that's one way of doing it that I, that I fully support. And uh, we have good legislation coming forward on that. And I think that we also, we, we do need to build more senior affordable housing. There's no doubt about it. Um, senior communities, the, the challenge is the financing. It's really hard, especially if there's any a, a level of assisted care. And so uh, it is a challenge that I'm up for, that I'm looking and, and, and bringing together task forces and trying to figure out before before jumping in, just throwing a bill out there. As, as, as Scott says, that's been happening in years past on a number of issues. CEQA and having people just throw a bill out there without really having the conversation with everyone at the table. Uh, I want to figure out a way to really incentivize local jurisdictions to build more senior affordable housing. Paula, Caroline, anything on it? So we've got a, a question here, and Leslie had raised it earlier uh, about the uh, Palmer decision, and it asks: Is there any hope for returning, restoring inclusionary zoning for apartments? Uh, would that work for developers? And uh, I know that's what uh, AB fifteen oh five Bloom yeah. uh, that is is doing that. Uh, would would all of you comment on? Yeah. On that? So before I, but before I hand it over to Paul, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we you know, San Jose was in a ten year odyssey <laughs> on our inclusionary housing for for sale uh, units that we ended up winning, and the rest of the state was kind of keeping an eye on that. Uh, Assembly I, member, will you give us some context for Palmer for those who may not? Yeah, know. and so Palmer really really was a court case that limited the ability for jurisdictions to have inclusionary housing for rental housing, and so. Um, so inclusionary housing would mean if you're building, you know, 100 units um, of, of rental, 100 homes in a rental community, let's say it's 50, like San Jose has 15% for sale. So if you have 15%, then 15 of those units have to be below market rate at varying levels. And um, so uh, uh, Assembly Member Bloom, AB 11, 1505, uh, is really t would allow for inclusionary housing and rental. It's gotten through, it just got through the Assembly, I think, the last week or, I think we voted on it last week or the week before. So it's now on to the Senate. Uh, I think it's important. I think it's an important tool. Again, uh, right now, um, it, it, it would, of course, uh, add cost uh, in the terms of, you know, and I'm sure we'll hear from that from Paul. But at the end of the day, allowing our communities to have more access to affordable housing and not have it in such a way where, OK, the affordable housing is over there. The market rates on the other side of town, but actually have our communities build together, our communities living together in these beautiful new communities that are being built by by our, the wonderful developers we do have in our state. Paul, um, just briefly, uh, the Palmer uh, Costa Hawkins bill basically said that the uh, the cities could not regulate prices, and that's what uh, the, the Palmer case was about, and, and therefore the, this bill is to is to allow that, and so. Um, requiring inclusionary was in, is in effect uh, uh, re regulating prices. Um, if, um, you know, what cities can do because of the San Jose case um, is uh, oppose, impose development impact fees and affordable housing impact fees on rental apartments now. So that's, that's the world we currently live in. And so uh, if we're building an apartment project and a city has an inclusionary housing ordinance that allows impact fees, then we pay those fees. Um, it, what this bill would, uh, would uh, allow is the actual requirement that those units get built in our projects. Um, if uh, a couple of things, if it gets phased in, that's one thing. I mean, we, we can handle it. We're a flexible group. We we adapt in, in terms of how we do our deal structures. It's uh, it it is a it is a significant cost burden because it's a subsidy. I don't think it's particularly attractive in highly dense projects because they are the most expensive ones to build and it's just philosophically I have a hard time building a $700,000 project and subsidizing a half a million dollars of it so we're creating a collection of lottery winners in, in, a, in a sense so I, I, I'm not a big fan of it because of that I would I would like I, I think that the um, the fee side of it and build a lot more units if we could build because there's there are really nice things you can build for 300,000 a unit. They don't have to be in high rises um, in good neighborhoods without creating the projects 
because I think that's what we're all trying to avoid is, is, is those things. Um, um, so I would like, uh, hopefully the, the cities, you know, have the, right now they have the, they would have the freedom to direct either the impact fees or the inclusionary that they would work with us. It is a significant burden administratively to administer that. Let's say if you're just building a 30 unit apartment project and now you've got to handle all the paperwork around um, ensuring that it's leased to us, you know, to four and a half people or whatever that, that, that thing is, um, that, that you could, you could do the in lieu out. When you get to the really sizable projects, then I think it might make a little bit more sense because you can have the economies of property management. But when you just have a handful of the affordable units in in a smaller project, it really is a burden and it lowers the, uh, it, it, it's really hard to get a good value out of it, harder to finance and the like. So, uh, and and so much of our business is, is what we can get financed and, and we don't control the capital markets. So. I, you know, uh, we will adapt as long as it can be phased in, so that our current projects don't get retroactively dinged. Uh, I think that you will. Uh, that would be an important part of the the bill. All right, maybe some agreement there. Uh, we have I'd hit. I'd just the, like to weigh in and say that Jones cities are <laughs> supporting 1505 as well. All right. So fantastic. I think we almost have consensus. Yeah, on so the panel. some some Thank consensus so on that. So. <laughs> so we had consensus on that on inclusionary. We had consensus on CEQA. <laughs> reform and uh, we sort of are in the circle around SB 35 with accountability and if we can get funding we can get there but please thank thank the panelists <laughs> very good discussion and uh, we, we've got work to do so uh, and I think we're all committed this is a group of advocates who are strongly committed to moving this forward and they will keep all of us accountable. So thank you. Great, great. Thank you. Thank uh, Emmett and our panelists one more time. So as we wrap up uh, and send you off on your your the rest of your Friday and hopefully a great weekend, we want to thank again our sponsors. Remind uh, we want to remind you to attend all the other events. Remember, reception in my backyard a week from today. Wine, beer, soft drinks, and food. You will not go home, home hungry. And, and free. And free. <laughs> free food, OK? Um, so um, let's see. We want to also announce that on your way out to please pick up your posters. Remember, that's your artwork. And uh, if the sponsors could also check the board outside the, the auditorium, you'll see that uh, you'll see if you won some prizes, OK? Leslie? I want to thank everybody for being here, and also thanks to Ron, if we can give Ron a, our MC. We feel uh, very, very uh, lucky to have such a great board uh, that Ron leads and all of the other board members who are here uh, today and who unfortunately couldn't make it uh, because they really, um, they really make us what we are. So thank you very much. Uh, I do, did want to say that we have sweatshirts and T-shirts. Uh, that are for sale. So if on your way out you want to buy a t-shirt for $10 or a sweatshirt for $25 and we have more if they run out, uh, you can proudly show uh, Silicon Valley at home uh, and uh, people can ask you what that means. So that would be great. And then again, uh, just to reiterate, if you're not a member, we'd love to have you be a member. We're only as strong as our member base and as we come forward and we support the elected officials in this room with some of the tough decisions that they're making uh, when they can see that we have uh, a, an army of people behind us that really helps them. So, um, so become a member. Thank you very much. Appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you Good so job. Much.